Welcome to Redemption Hill Church. Good morning. Well, if I can invite you in back to your seats. So good to be back with you guys. We're, my family and I were out of town last week, and so we dearly missed you. We're so glad to be back together. Well, if you brought your Bible this morning, I hope you did, please turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where we want to spend our time today. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you today, we do have paperback uh, versions of the Bible next to the coffee over there on the, uh, on the counter. We're on page 623 in that edition. We'll read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 26. Please join me as we read God's word together. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the one body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with, with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the cooling of the air, for the sunshine outside. We thank you, Lord, that we came in this morning uh, with a cool breeze. We're able to smell the air outside. We're able to hear birds singing. Um, we come in this morning to your church because we're all members of it, because we have all, like one another, been baptized into your Son by the Holy Spirit, given faith, redeemed from our sins, called your children. We thank you, Father, for the gift of this church, for the gift of one another. We thank you for the gift of song, for the gift of preaching, for the gift of hearing and learning from you. I pray now, God, that you would speak through me, that you'd help us to look and see wonderful things from your word, to learn more about you, to learn more about what it is to be members of your body. For your glory, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's a pastor in D.C. named Mark Dever who, um, who we have a lot of respect for and is a friend of our ministry, and he wrote a wonderful little book called What is a Healthy Church? He begins his book with the following parable. Nose and hand were sitting in the church pew talking. The morning service, led by ear and mouth, had just ended. And Hand was telling Nose that he and his family had been struggling with feeling disconnected from the rest of the church. Really? Nose responded to Hand's news. Why is that? Oh, I don't know, Hand said, looking down. He was usually slower to speak than the other members of the body. I guess because the church doesn't have what Mrs. Hand and I are looking for. Well, what are you looking for in a church? Nose asked. The tone in which he spoke these words was sympathetic. But even as he spoke them, he knew that he dismissed Hand's answer. If the Hands, if Mr. and Mrs. Hand couldn't see that Nose and the rest of the leadership were pointing the church body in the right direction, then the body could do without them. Hand had to think before answering. He and Mrs. Hand liked Pastor Mouth, and they liked his family. And Minister of Music, Ear, he meant well. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, I wish there were more members like us. We tried spending time with the legs, but we didn't connect with them. 
Next, we joined the small group for all the toes, but they all talked about socks and shoes and odors, and that didn't interest us either. Nose looked at him this time with genuine dismay. Aren't you glad that they're concerned with odors? <laughs> sure, but it's not for us. Then we attended the Sunday school for all you facial features. Do you remember? But everyone just wanted to talk and listen and smell and taste. It felt like, well, it felt like you never wanted to get your hands dirty and get to work. Anyway, Mrs. Hand and I are frustrated that we don't do more clapping and hand raising, which is really what we're passionate about. Hmm. Those replied, I see what you mean. At that moment, Mrs. Hand, who'd been caught up in another conversation, turned back to join her husband and Nose. Hand briefly explained what he and Nose had been talking about, and Mrs. Hand nodded in an agreement. Her husband had made just enough critical remarks about the church over the years that her heart had begun to reflect his. Now, he had never burst, burst into an open tirade against the body. In fact, he usually apologized for being so negative, as he put it. But the little complaints that he let slip out here and there had an effect. Bitterness had begun to grow in their hearts toward the body. The hands had begun to wonder whether they even fit with the rest of the body. Well, at this point, the conversation had run on too long for nose. He thanked Mrs. Hand for being so honest and repeated that he was sorry to hear that they were unhappy. And then he just turned and walked away. He hadn't been interested in the conversation in any way, as he didn't really think that the hands fit together with the rest of the body. The hands left feeling just as unappreciated as before. They left feeling out of joint. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> well, this morning, I am not announcing that Pastor John, who would represent mouth, and Rob, who would represent ear, I think, are in a conflict and that they're angry with one another or that they don't think that the other should belong in the body. I'm honestly grateful that I'm not coming here this morning because our church is experiencing division or disunity in any way that I am currently aware of. However, it is a humorous parable and one that we can all relate to in a number of ways and for a number of reasons. And while the application of it could be read in a bunch of different ways, the primary point of the parable and the primary point of the text this morning is that God has designed his church, God has designed his body to be, to be made up of diverse members, hands and feet, ears, nose, mouth, eyes. They're all different. And yet they're all made to function in a way that they're inescapably dependent upon one another. God has made his church so that all the members of the body are necessary and need to be working together in order to have a healthy church. So hand and nose were both more concerned with what they had to do, uh, with what they were made to do uniquely. And they didn't see why others' function was just as important as their own. And because of feeling unappreciated, division began to grow among the body. And it stopped functioning like it was made to. They started thinking about themselves and how they wanted other members just like them. What they had a hard time seeing, and what we can sometimes have a hard time seeing today, is that God designed the body to function in complementary ways. The body is not made up of all hands or all nose or all mouth or all feet. Rather, it's made up of different members and all different from one another, but with a unifying factor that they all have been designed to function together as a body, as a whole. And that's something to celebrate. That's something to, uh, to look at the fact that each member brings a different and unique function within, without which the rest of the body would cease to function as a healthy body. And that is a unity worth protecting. So what we're going to see today in our text is that as members of the body of Christ, unique and different from one another in a variety of ways, we should celebrate our diversity and preserve our unity. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. So the first thing that we see here in these, in these first three verses is that God has designed his people to function not as individual members primarily, but as a body together as a whole. This section of the letter is both informative as well as corrective. As you know, the book of 1 Corinthians was written to a church in trouble, to a church in division. They had a distorted view of spiritual gifts, prizing, prizing some gifts, probably tongues, <coughs> more than others. And that was contributing towards division and animosity within the church. Add to that, as we learn in 1 Corinthians 11, you had the haves and the have-nots. They weren't getting along. And so Paul was rebuking them. <coughs> So this letter is both informative as well as corrective. The church wasn't functioning the way that God had designed it to function. Certain parts of the body were celebrated, while other parts of the body were simply unappreciated. So here, Paul corrects their overemphasis on certain conspicuous gifts or 
on those within the, within the body who were perhaps more impressive than others uh, or more worldly, you know, likable. And, and that they felt that set them apart and above the rest of the members. So there, was, there were these feelings of superiority. There were these elitists within the church that thought, we're the important ones, and the rest of these, we can, you know, the other people, we can, we can really do without, as we saw in the parable. Now, in the first few verses of, of chapter 12, we see um, that unity and diversity belongs to the character of God himself. So within the members of the Godhead, there are diverse functions and yet true unity. Um, and now in, ver- in, uh, in 12 through 14, we see him focus on our common experience of the Spirit in conversion as the key to our unity. So our unity is not found in the fact that we're all from the same place. We're not all from you know, this locale. We're not all gifted the same way or we all look the same way or we don't all have, we don't all live in the same socioeconomic status. We don't all make the same amount of money or live in the same houses in the same neighborhood or anything. The common the commonality to our unity is our common experience of the Holy Spirit. So we see that for as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Verse 13, for in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So Paul's heart is for unity in the church, but not uniformity. We're not all to look alike and talk alike and act alike. We're not all going to listen to the same music and watch the same movies and go to the same places. And yet, Paul makes it clear that, that while we are different, while we look different and talk different and, and do different things, we are made... Uh, <laughs> sorry. We are all made to drink of the same spirit. So that's where our commonality is. So he makes that clear in talking about Jews and Greeks, slaves and free. How much more different can you have? Jews and Greeks of the day were not friends. They weren't buddies. They weren't going. They weren't sitting at the same restaurants together and having meals together. They looked at one another with animosity. They saw it as an us versus them kind of thing. Slaves are free. Can you imagine slaves and free men hanging out together? And yet that's what Paul points to. The unity of the body of Christ, listen, this is important because the unity of the body of Christ, when you see Jews and Greeks hanging out together, slaves and free hanging out together, Cowboys fans and Eagles fans hanging out together, that's a unity that is deepened by our diversity, isn't it? That's the body of Christ. When you see people that look different and that are from different places that are, that are made differently together because what holds them together is their common experience of salvation, their common experience of the Holy Spirit. So our unity is deepened by our diversity, not aggravated by our diversity. God wants us to appreciate how how differently he has made each of us. So for Paul, the reception of the Spirit is really the, the one thing that is absolutely essential to the life of the Christian. The Spirit is what essentially distinguishes the believer from the unbeliever. We see that earlier in this book. In Galatians, we see that the Spirit is what especially marks the beginning of the Christian life. And in Romans 8, we see that the Spirit above above all is what makes a person the child of God. The point here is that every Christian has been made part of the body by the reception of the Holy Spirit when they became a Christian. It's here in the body of Christ It's here that we become interdependent, okay, interdependent limbs of the same body, organs and ears and eyes and hands and feet, big toes and little toes, all dependent upon one another. So God doesn't save you and call you to live the Christian life in isolation from other members. He calls you to be part of the body. We can't live the life that that God has called us to live. We can't function as we're called to function simply as a big toe or simply as a hand or a foot, or an eye, or a mouth. This section teaches that if you're a Christian, you need to be, you should be a committed member of the body, a committed member of a local church. If you are a Christian, you've been made a part of the body of Christ himself. And so if you're part of the body of Christ, then you need to call, then you're called to function as a part of the body of Christ. I mean, something would be wrong, right, if a hand or an eye or a mouth was trying to, wasn't functioning in the body. So if my, if my limbs stopped working, Something's wrong there. It's not, made, it's not functioning the way that it's intended to function. 
The idea of a hand or an eye or a foot living and functioning apart from the body sounds like something out of a science fiction novel or a science fiction movie, right? The hand that just exists, that just kind of shows up there. And so the, eye of a lone, the idea of a Lone Ranger Christian, of a Christian who just lives the life, you know, who just kind of bounces around and, and lives the life in isolation from others is totally foreign to the Bible. Now listen, again, this isn't a, we're not coming in, John didn't, I didn't plan the sermon this morning because it's a corrective word for our church. I feel kind of silly even, even talking about this because you guys all do this so remarkably well. I see people coming in and looking to serve on their first Sundays here a lot of times, I and mean, it's just silly to me, and it's embarrassing to me sometimes when I kind of can complain about serving in certain ways, and I see brand new people doing this. But the fact is that this is God's word, and, and there are those among us who are looking, you know, we just know from conversation that there are those who are looking to, for ways to get more involved. And so if, if that's you, we'd love to talk to you more about that. As John mentioned, if you're not a member, but you'd like to learn more about what it would look like to be a member, we've got these membership classes coming in the coming weeks that you can come to and, and ask questions and learn more about what it would look like to be a member of this local church. The point that we see, though, in these first few verses is that God has designed the body. God has designed the body to function as interdependent members one of another. And so in the next section, in verses 15 through 20, we see that every member is different and every member is necessary. So nobody is useless, nobody's inferior. We're called to celebrate our diversity. Paul here addresses the division head on with those who saw some members as, as superior and others as inferior. And he basically reinforces their diversity and simultaneously says every member is necessary for the church to function as a body. So Paul wanted to address those in the church who felt, who felt superior. There were those in the church who, who looked and said, okay, now what I do is crucial. And gosh, if I didn't show up on Sunday morning, I mean, what would the church even do, right? The church couldn't function without me. Now, in a sense that that's true because the, the church needs all the members to function. But it's not simply the hand that's needed to function. The hand is needed just as much as the foot's needed. And the eye is needed just as much as the mouth is needed. Every member is necessary for the, fun for the church to function as a body. And there's, and there's nobody that should feel inferior or useless or unnecessary in the life of the church. If you're coming in this morning, if you're coming into the, to the church and you feel like, you know, I don't really feel like I make a difference here. We want to talk to you about that because you do, because God has designed that every member, he has gifted every one of you in, in a unique way to function as part of the church. And a lot of times we can, we can take that for granted. We can take our own gifts for granted. We can take the gifts of others for granted. And we can think that it's not that necessary, but that is denying the design of our sovereign God. Paul shows sensitive, sensitivity here to those who who were made to feel that they had no special spiritual gift. He encourages the unglorious members that they are not any less part of the body than the glorious members. For example, ears that constantly hear someone say how beautiful the eyes are can easily get the idea that they're inconsequential. And the eyes can easily get the idea that they are all important. But both eyes and ears, hands and feet, have their assigned function in the body without which the body becomes disabled. The failure of one little valve can shut down the whole bodily system. So the, the implication there is that there is no inconsequential member or gift or person in the body of Christ. Every person has purpose. Every per person has worth. In verses 15 and 16, Paul, just, Paul says that just because the, the apparently, or it says that the apparently superior cannot say to the apparently inferior that I have no need of you, that we can get along without you. Rather, Paul rebukes them and says, you're just not thinking clearly. The, the hand can't say to the foot that we can get along without you or that you're not part of the body. You are part of the body. You are connected to the body. You might not be functioning the way that God has called you to function. And so he just says that they're, they're confused about that. And the body, likewise, just as the hand can't function apart from the body, the body doesn't function properly with, if the hand's not working. So just because you look at John or at Rob or Mark or Dean or whoever it is, and you think that you're not gifted in the same way, you don't serve in such a pronounced or public manner, 
that doesn't make you any less a part of the body of Christ as they are. It doesn't make you any less needed than they are. Just because somebody serves publicly and somebody serves privately, just because somebody puts in a lot of hours that others see and others say thank you for and others might serve in prayer. And maybe you're in a season of life where you're not able to spend a lot of hours doing something, but you're praying and you're looking for opportunities to encourage others with your words, with a, no with a note or an email. It doesn't change one iota of your worth before God or your function and your worth to the body. Pastor John Piper preached a sermon on this text, and he said something that I, I wanted to share with you. Piper says, every person in the body of Christ is, is, is designed in a unique way to manifest something of the Spirit of God that nobody else can. Listen, every person is designed in a unique way to manifest something of the Spirit of God that nobody else can. God has designed you uniquely. When the special grace of salvation mixes with the common grace of personhood, there's a unique manifestation in human life of the Spirit of God. Do you hear that? Every person has been made uniquely. You've been gifted to serve as part of the body. You have been grafted into the body of Christ and called to function in a certain way, called to work, called to contribute toward the body of Christ. Without you, we don't function the way that we're called to function. God created you and gifted you differently than anybody else in this room. And so he has a purpose for you here in this church. So the point here is the need for all members of the body to function properly. We need you. You are needed. You have worth. God has a purpose for you in this church. Verse 17 says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, he says, as he chose. So the diversity of the body, Paul writes, is part of the divine plan of God. It's his design. So every member is here and gifted and arranged in such a way that is there by divine placement. And so we look to our God who has placed us here and we say, God, how have you called me to function as part of the body? And there's a variety of gifts, right? There's a variety of ways. Some of us are going to serve you know, up here on the stage singing, and you all know that that's not me. Thank God that that's not me. Thank God that we have others who have the gift of song. We have others who know what a tune is. We have others who know what appropriate volume is. God has gifted you in a unique way, so what is that? But the emphasis here, the emphasis here is not necessarily on identifying your spiritual gift. The, the emphasis here is on the need of every member of the body. The emphasis isn't on, it's not in, it's, this isn't the call, the application this week isn't to go home and to do a spiritual gifts analysis questionnaire, and there's nothing wrong with that. Those are good. It's good to identify your gifts. It's good to know how you're gifted and where you serve best, where you're most fruitful, where you're most effective in the body of Christ. But the emphasis here is on the necessity of each member of the body of Christ. And so if you don't know where you're gifted, but you see an area that, that needs help. If you see an area that, that needs service, the, the call is to, that you should have a burden to say, I wonder if I could help there. I wonder if I could serve there. I wonder if I could be of use there. I wonder if God would use me to bless others the way that others bless me. So the emphasis is on the need for every member of the body of Christ. And so this should bring us deep joy and encouragement. God has made you. He has saved you. He has made you a part of his family and given you gifts as he has seen fit to use you according to his sovereign design, according to his purposes for you, and according to his purposes for the church body and the world at large. So Paul goes on to make the obvious point here two more times in the next two verses. He says, he says here, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And he said the same thing early in verse 14. He says that same thing three times in this small section. When you, when, you, when you see something like that in Scripture, right, you see things emphasized, you see words repeated, you see statements made over and over again, you've got to pay attention. You notice that this word body, he says that a lot in here. I actually counted 18 times in 15 verses, Paul uses the word body. 
So he's trying to emphasize there's something, right? He's not emphasizing you as an individual, but you collectively as you relate to the rest of the body. He's emphasizing that we belong one to another. That's significant. So we were made for more than ourselves. We were made for more than a life of a, of a single Christian. And it's similar on a football team, isn't it? Some of you might go home today and, and watch a football game, and you'll see that it's not just the quarterback or the running back or the halfback or the strong safety or the linebacker that wins the game or that scores a touchdown. The team is made up of lots of different people with lots of different gifts or abilities or roles, functions. And it takes 11 men working together, functioning together to score a touchdown or to make that pick and run it back. And it's the same in the church with each person in their place doing what they can to advance the purposes to contribute to the whole. We're made up, we're a body made up of diverse parts. We're all different. We're gifted differently. We have different backgrounds and different histories. And that means that God has a reason for that. God has made you and given you that background, given you those gifts, given you those abilities to contribute something specific here to this church, to the body of Christ as a whole. So we need John's gifts and Rob's gifts and Matthew's gifts and Daniel's gifts and everyone here to function the way that God has made you in order for us as a church to function as God has intended us. There isn't a person here who isn't necessary in the plan of our all-wise God. But notice, so if you look around, and again, if you're, if you're wondering where to serve, if you're wondering, gosh, where do I fit in? You, you look around and you look for who's that person who, maybe, there, maybe there's somebody who's sitting here this morning who is by themselves or they're quiet or they look downcast. Maybe God would use you to go over there and, and, and start a conversation and to, to initiate something, to encourage them, to pray for them. Maybe you come in on a Sunday morning. Maybe, maybe you know, a lot of times it's so easy. You know, a, a lot of us here have kids. I've got, I've got kids. A lot of us here have kids, and, or we have just busy lives. We come in on Sunday mornings where our minds are distracted and we're thinking about a lot of different things. Uh, maybe we're anxious about something, or maybe we're, we're really hoping that the preacher doesn't go long so that we can get home in time for the noon kickoff. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's easy to come in here on, on Sunday mornings, um, just kind of, this is our habit, this is what we do, we just show up. But God's called us to, to more than that, hasn't he? God's called us to come in together with intentionality, to come in and to consider, how can God use me this morning? Maybe, maybe it's by pray, spending extra time praying that morning. God, would you use me to bless somebody? Would you use me to encourage somebody? Could, could I speak a word of encouragement to, to somebody privately? Or maybe, maybe like you know, one of our members did this morning, it's publicly. Maybe God would use you to come and exhort the body with, it, with an encouragement from his holy word. So, so somehow God has gifted you to serve. Or maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's a more practical thing. Maybe... You know, maybe you're not, a, you're not a talky kind of person. You're not a mouth. You don't, you're not a you know, conversive. You're not an extrovert. You're introverted. Maybe, you, maybe you're a hands-on kind of guy. So maybe if that's you, you, you look around and, and you see, gosh, these chairs had to get set up somehow. There's a stage there. I know that that didn't just show up. You know, pretty soon there's going to be a trailer to drive to our school. And there's going to be additional things necessary. And so maybe that's you and you want to go and grab Mark Wally or John or I and say, hey, how can I help? I'm hands. Hey, mouth, I'm hands. Where can I function? Where, where, where do I need to work? God is going to use you. God is using you to strengthen and to serve, to nourish, to mature, to help our church grow into a fully functioning body as God has intended it. John Calvin, theologian from... 500 years ago now, said something about this passage in his commentary. He said, whatever, therefore, any one of us has, let him know that it has been given him for the edification of his brethren in common, and let him accordingly bring it forward and not keep it back, buried, as it were, within himself, or make use of it as his own. Let not the man who is endowed with superior gifts be puffed up with pride and despise others, but let him consider that there is nothing so diminutive as to be of no use, 
as in truth, even the least among us, even the least among the pious brings forth fruit according to his slender capacity so that there is no useless member in the church. So God has designed us to function as a body. He has designed us to function with diverse giftings. And he has deemed every member as absolutely necessary. Finally, we see in this last section, verses 21 through 26, every member is inescapably dependent upon the rest. And no member is superior. No member is self-sufficient. So it seems from the, these verses that there were those in the church who, as we discussed, kind of considered themselves at the, top, at the top of the food chain. And they were of the opinion that they could get along just fine without the others. I mean, there, there are those among us, right? We, we might not, we, we probably wouldn't say it that way. We wouldn't look at somebody else and say, I don't need you. But really, I feel like I could get along, I could, I could get along all right without the rest of the church. I could get along just fine if it was me and my Bible. I've got the Lord. Okay? And I can, I can make it through this life. And, they're, and, and they were acting, I mean, in, in Corinth, we actually see Paul rebuking them because they were saying to one another, I have no need of you. Your gifts aren't that important. You're not that necessary here. You are inferior to me. I am more important. And so we see them acting out of their uh, self-sufficiency and, and basically communicating that others are superfluous or dispensable. Or maybe it's, maybe it's a group of people who are acting independently and, and they're just avoiding, they're just simply avoiding fellowship, thinking that they can function on their own. So Paul here shows them the foolishness of their ways. He goes on to show them that the parts of the body that appear to be weaker, that's what he says here, the parts of the body that appear to be weaker are actually indispensable. Their apparent weakness, their fleshly, worldly, apparent weakness has nothing to do with God's value of them and their worth to the church. Listen, that's not something to just skip over. We can look at someone and say, yeah, what, is, what does that guy really bring? What does he bring? But, but to do so is to ignore God's decree. God has said, this person, I've given this person, this individual, you and you and you and you and you and me, he has gifted us toward one another for the purpose, for all of our collective good. And so we want to value what God values. Bodily appearances are, can be deceiving, but all the parts of nece are necessary. You need the other parts of the body. I need the other parts of the body. They're invaluable to the health of the church. The inner organs and other parts are actually critical to the very survival of the body. Have you ever, have you ever had... Maybe, maybe you've ever had a, um, you know, one small part of your body that you know, something goes wrong. You didn't even know you had that part of the body. And all of a sudden, your whole life is turned around. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's that little tooth back here. It's this little tooth back here that you never even think about. You forget that that tooth is there. You think that that tooth is of little consequence. But man, if that tooth get, develops in a toothache, you can't do anything. You can't study. You can't work. You, it's hard to hold conversations. It's hard to lay down without addressing the toothache. A few weeks ago, uh, a couple months ago, I hurt one of my little toes, one toe. And because of the hurt I did to that one toe, it was hard to walk. If I didn't wrap it, if I didn't address it, it was hard to walk. It was hard to play. I'd be down on the floor with my boys, and I would, I would turn the wrong way, and I was just in excruciating pain. Every member... Every member is necessary for the body to function the way it's supposed to. And so, so Paul is not simply rebuking them. He's actually appealing to them to care for the rest of the body. He's appealing to them to value what God values, to look around and to, to see how God is using you and, and to say, okay, John, I, I don't know if you know this man, but you, you didn't even say anything specifically to me, but God used you to encourage me this way. Maybe it was Mike this morning. He shared that word, and, and God ministered to your soul that morning. And it's, and it's going over and grabbing that person, letting them know, hey, I just want you to know. I, mean, that, that was, I know you're not like a, a, a public kind of guy. And the fact that you did that, God ministered to me that way. It's valuing those people both internally and, and telling them that they're valued, telling them, hey, pointing out, here's how God is using you in my life. So he's appealing to them to care for the rest of the body because when, when certain members of the body aren't functioning uh, well together, 
aren't functioning in the, in the life of the church, it's not just them that suffers. It, it, it is them that suffers. Okay, so if, so if Joe stopped coming to church and Joe started living life as an individual Christian, well, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to suffer from a lack from the rest of the body, right? But so does the rest of the body. So when we have someone who, who withdraws, when we have someone who, who gets sick, so if your hand gets sick, your toe gets hurt, your tooth gets hurt, you want to address it because if you don't address that, if you don't have the whole body functioning the way that it's intended to, then, then the rest of the body suffers along with that individual member. So if my hand gets hurt, I can't say, oh, well, you know, I hope it gets better. No, I mean, I can't function without the use of, of my hand. And so it is with you and me. All this concern for the body is for the purpose of enabling it to operate in unity so all its, per so all its parts will respond to each other's needs. Bible scholar and commentator David Garland says, the principle of love embodied in the cross mandates that one should always seek honor for others, which, which stands in absolute antithesis to the dominant value that seeks honor for oneself in a preening self-indulgence. The, the, the love embodied in the cross. So it calls us to seek honor in others and for others and not simply for ourselves. So this means, as Paul says here, that if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Suffering and rejoicing together are a sign of unity in which each one truly seeks the advantage of the other. Now again, church, this is where I see you guys excelling. As, as a pastor, you know, I've, I've talked with most of you, and I'm, I'm aware of, of some of the trials that that you walk through and some of the pain that you walk through. I'm aware of, of some of the wonderful things that we, that we celebrate. We've got um, a number of ladies right now who, who have the gift of a child. Uh, and I've seen, you know, just yesterday, my family personally benefited because others came together to throw a baby shower uh, for some of the ladies here. So I see you rejoicing together and I see you suffering together. I see when one member suffers, I see others coming alongside you. I see others coming along and, and providing meals or meeting with you and caring for you, seeking to encourage you. I see you doing that for one another. And so, th so this is an area where this is not, again, this isn't a corrective word at all. This is me pointing that out and saying, this is good. You're functioning as the body should. And we're all benefiting. Our whole church is healthier. Our whole church benefits and matures and grows and better reflects the love of Christ for this world because of the way that you're doing that. So I'm so grateful that I'm not here this morning addressing the envy and the pride and the division that is rampant in the church. I'm so glad that we don't have the haves on this side of the room and the have-nots over here and they're giving each other the stink eye in the service. I'm so glad that, that I'm not that we're just not addressing and, and trying to reconcile groups of people together. We see the love and the joy that exists in our small groups and on Sunday mornings. And so we want to, we don't want to take that for granted. We want to preserve that. We want to protect that. We want to guard the unity of the body of Christ. We want to guard the unity of our local body here at Redemption Hill. But if this hasn't been your experience, maybe, and I know that some of us, I know that while on the whole we're doing well, I know also that some of us, not everybody, has that experience. Maybe you're wondering how can you show care for one another? Or maybe you haven't been exposed to the love and the mutual encouragement that I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe I'm speaking and this, and this just hasn't been your experience. Um, maybe you are here this morning and you're feeling like, gosh, I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm that important in the life of the church, if I'm that necessary. But I want to appeal to you the same way that Paul appeals to the Corinthians, that there's, that there's more for you there. There's more, God intends more for you than simply showing up. God wants you to grow and to mature and to experience the pleasure and the glory of Christ in your own life. And so, so part of the way that we have uh, part of the way that we have you know, designed this local church is that we do most of our church life through small groups together. 
So we have, right now we have four different small groups that meet basically four times a month for the purpose of fellowship, for the purpose of uh, growth and accountability, for the purpose of joy and laughter and, and simpler relationship, for the purpose of suffering together and rejoicing together and honoring those whom God would honor. And so if you haven't been able to attend a small group, consider going, consider checking one out. This week's a great week to check one out. What do we have? We have the uh, adult meeting. No groups this week. <laughs> we'll hold one for you. If you'd like to attend a small group just with me, just let me know. I'm eager. Next week is a wonderful week to attend a small group. And so we'd love to talk to you about that. I love my wife. I'm so grateful for her. I don't know what I'd do without her. See, that's the body functioning. There's memory and mouth. We've got to work together. God's design is for you to function as part of the body fully as he has gifted you, fully as he intends you, to experience the fullness of the glory of Christ in your own life and to contribute toward the glory of Christ and the pleasure of Christ in others. So just as he calls you to, to, to be part of the body for you, he calls you to be the part of the body for Mike and for Ricky and for Aaron, both to give care and to receive care. That's why we come, come together in our small groups or on Sunday mornings with a ministry mindset. We come together with intentionality, saying, how can I be used today, God, to reflect your glory, to reflect your grace? As John mentioned last week, to, to show hospitality to others. And again, you guys do this so well. In response to last week's sermon, John preached on hospitality, and we got multiple invitations to dinner this week. You guys are so quick to apply this, and I love it. So maybe for you, it's simply sharing a word of encouragement with somebody this morning, or it's praying for someone, or maybe there's, a, there's a, another more tangible means of grace that you could be used of. Maybe it's helping somebody move. I was talking with somebody this morning who is getting ready to move here, and so maybe for some of you, that's your spiritual gift of serving, is, is helping load and unload boxes and open up boxes and unpack or bring in a meal. In conclusion, Paul emphasizes in this passage that diversity in the body is something divinely designed and therefore absolutely necessary. If any think that they are so gifted that they can do without the others, Paul calls you to a renewed sense of unity, a renewed sense of community. One person alone, no matter how gifted, cannot play a Beethoven symphony, cannot act out a Shakespearean tragedy, cannot compete against another team on the football field. The same is true in the church. It can never be a solo performance. So let us not say this morning, I have no need of Chase or of Aaron. But let us have the same care for one another. Let us honor those whom God has placed around us. Let us look around this room and see that God has gifted every one of these people to be in my life. And God has gifted me to be involved in their lives. And God, how would you use me to do that? So let's get to work employing the gifts that God has given us. Let us celebrate the different gifts in those around us. Let us put our trust in God who has divinely designed all of us to function as a body. As members of the body of Christ, we should celebrate our diversity and preserve our unity. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the silly parable at the beginning about ear and mouth, and nose and hands. But we thank you, God, for the truths that are displayed and communicated in your word, that that's who we are. We are all different members of the same body of Christ, gifted differently, looking differently, acting differently, with different strengths and different weaknesses. Some of us are very aware of our weakness, and we wonder, how could God ever use me? And God, I thank you that you have designed 
even for those who think that they're the weakest among us. You've given them worth and real purpose in the body of Christ. And God, we thank you for those who, who appear strong in our midst. And we thank you for those who are truly strong and are gifted in different ways. God, I pray that you would help us all to celebrate our individual diversity. Help us to show care for one another. To put away any selfish tendencies, any spiritual one-upmanship. And to work hard for the glory of Christ and the unity of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.